Imagine yourself a child, not just any child, but one that is blessed with rich traditions of African heritage, a culture that cultivates respect for your elders, a culture that puts family above all else, a culture that loves nature and reveres the gifts it offers, a culture that thrives on hard work and ingenuity to overcome adversity. But then you are a child growing up in the harsh realities of a large family without enough food to eat. School, a long treacherous walk away with a tree as your classroom. You feel isolated from any help. The overcrowded shanty towns of the cities and the primitive rural village are all seemingly a far cry for opportunities for scientific endeavor. That was the beginning for all African science heroes. Their poverty fueled their ambitions. Their hunger energized their determination. Their childhood hardships taught them life lessons of innovation and creativity, hallmarks of many a great scientist. African science heroes have invented, discovered, and postulated remarkable scientific advancements in large equipped laboratories and small rural villages. The African culture shaped their destiny and forged a road to scientific achievement. African science heroes stand for triumph over adversity and the personal values of sustained hard work, extraordinary imagination, and unfaltering dedication. Frederick Musisi is a lead farmer from a small village in the north of Malawi. As a lead farmer, he educates and trains the local community on good farming practice, like manure production and rainwater harvesting. He dropped out of school in grade five because of lack of school fees, but that has not stopped him from inventing remarkable useful devices. Frederick is a fantastic example of necessity being the mother of innovation. His need and his interest to have these appliances spurned his creativity. I think imagination and innovation is very important because that's what brings about development in science. L learning the theory from textbooks and from what people have developed is a stepping stone. But apart from that, going outside the box of what you've learned and being imaginative and innovative and trying to find whether what they've proposed is good or works is, is the key to the development. <laughs> Most education system, I'll talk to particular letter say in Kenya, it, it's exam oriented. So it's not a matter of someone, if you can cram and then pass the exam, fine. But will it help in solving a problem? No. As a science teacher myself, I encourage my students to be free thinkers. To think the way I think. To be able to think in a different way. 
does cost lots of hours and lots of dedication and discipline to really uh, to be creative in a productive way in a modern society, uh, to try and come up with something which helps people. I've published about 171 papers around. I've had five patents to my name, and uh, I have systems which are floating around in aircraft, in cars, you name it, in trains, and people are enjoying flying in aircraft in first class comfortably. My systems are there navigating the aircraft, controlling the aircraft. I'm motivated in science because I know the things that I do in one way or another is benefiting society. Growing up in remote villages offers unique opportunities for innovation. In my own view, I think Karuro and Young Africa get more opportunities. But harnessing this later on is where the struggle comes in. Because of the rural setup. I mean, nobody will give you a toy in Naji, but the children have to create their own toys. To a, for a child to create their own toy, it means they have to be observant on other real things, real objects, and then they try to make sure that they actualize this object in terms of toys. The brightest people are not necessarily in the cities. Go ahead and might be the brightest, you know, person, you know, in the room. But he has to be, he might discover himself, but it might be better for him to be discovered. Tabelo Nyoikong grew up in a village in Lesotho after her family fled the South African apartheid violence in 1960. She went to a primary school where most lessons were conducted under a tree. This taught her that people can learn even in very difficult situations with dedicated teachers. She would alternate between attending school and herding her grandmother's sheep. Shepherding increased her self-confidence because she concluded that she could do anything a boy could do. I fell in love with chemistry. I love getting into the lab, doing physics experiments. We also had to do biology and grow plants, and I love that. Her research focus is on a cancer diagnosis and treatment methodology known as photodynamic therapy. She's the director of DSC MinTech Nanotechnology Innovation Center South Africa and a 2009 L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science winner. We talk a lot about you know, poverty and difficulty in, in Africa, and it's true. Um, but there are some advantages that come from that sort of thing. People are hardy. People are survivors. Being an African and coming from a very deprived environment gives you that kind of resistance to, to move on. Jibisa Ejita grew up in a one room thatched hut in a poor rural village in Ethiopia. In my household, in as much as I had lots of love uh, because of the limited income, life was a struggle on a daily basis. So, Hunger is something that I have personally experienced. He would walk 20 kilometers to school every week. Decades later, he is a distinguished professor, plant breeder, and geneticist at Purdue University, USA. He's produced high-yielding drought and weed-resistant sorghum. His research on sorghum, a staple diet, has improved the food security of 500 million people in Africa. This won him the World Food Prize in 2009. It's not alone the, 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 the knowledge or the intelligence because everyone has it, but it's the, it's the motivation behind it, the dedication to, to, to do the work that makes it different. Someone coming from a poor background and having this kind of opportunity to do, it's, it's, it comes with a different kind of uh, different kind of force behind it. You are more, even no matter how tough it gets, you still stand in it. Girls certainly need more force or determination to succeed in a predominantly male scientific world. When we look at um, the agriculture or science sector, only 20% 20, 20 of the managers are women. When we go to the farms, 80% of the farm workers are women. What is happening? How are we going to help this young girl know that science is not just for boys, but science is for all? 
Prominent African women scientists include Professor Rose Leke, an immunologist at the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon, who researches focus on malaria transmission in pregnant women. She is highly recognized for research as well as promoting homegrown scientific talent. Women do not only innovate in research labs, but in family homes as well as rural farmlands. Women scientists, we are many. Um, when I tell you that there's a woman in Trukana, in the middle of nowhere, no running water, no electricity, but she's able to feed her child with nutritious foods that have been macerated. What this woman scientist and innovator does is choose the food and then feeds it to her child. While a woman in Nairobi will use a blender, she will use her teeth. She has become innovative. She is indeed a scientist. African science heroes come from all over the continent from various scientific disciplines. Included amongst many others are the likes of Thomas Ojambo, winner of the Africa Prize for Leadership, who is most recognized for establishing the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology, ISIPE. ISIPE Kenya has trained and promoted the development of indigenous knowledge and technology systems. Philip Imajiwali, Nigerian supercomputer and internet pioneer, who was a child soldier and refugee in the Nigeria Biafran War. Against the backdrop of racism in the USA in 1989, he performed the world's fastest computation. Nelson Siwankambo, who has refused offers to migrate to Western universities, has remained in Uganda to spearhead research for over 20 years that has changed the treatment, prevention, and care of AIDS. Francis Alute from Ghana, a world authority on nuclear physics, mathematics, and information technology for development. There, if there are no, no role models, the future to them is, is somehow broken. It's blocked. Yeah, because they cannot think of going, uh, going ahead with their education you know, if more role models are not there. But if more role models are there, oh, they look at that particular person. No, if I, if I can continue with this schooling, if I can work hard in school, if I can work hard in science subject, or be like that particular person, it is very good to have role models in your community. So if the women, if the women can do, if they can reach to those levels of being scientists, then why not me? It means that I get inspired and then go to their also level, to be encouraged to go to the level. Some of these girls have been brought up in typical rural life where you haven't seen a doctor, the only person maybe you have seen is a teacher. So we are acting like role models, but we need different role models in science so that students can become maybe doctors, can become nurses, can become engineers. If I know about her, then as I said, I'll be more inspired to be like her. And when I be like her, everyone will be like, wow, that woman scientist, we should also be like her and people will be motivated. By publicizing the accomplishments of African scientists and showing young, less privileged Africans what can be achieved in any walk of life with the help of role models that they can identify with, we can begin to nurture in young Africans ambitious aspirations.